What's up, what's up, what's up? I'm Brand Man Sean. And I'm Corey. And we are back with episode number 27 of No Labels Necessary Podcast. You can catch us every Tuesday, every Thursday on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, all those great places, busting down the music industry, the content creator economy when it comes to cash, marketing, and overall business. And as always, y'all know, we like to get into advice to pop off the show. And today, we got some really dope advice that any of y'all that want to get involved in music, the in- industry, in terms of your career, take this advice. And it's coming from our guy, Kayvon, from, who works at Genius. But I'll let him speak a little bit on himself because he does that in this clip, too. Industry, here's something I've learned in my career that might help you in yours. I'm the director of A&R Genius, and I've been in the industry now for about seven years. This is something that I've learned that I think is, is helping me even now. Make sure you can identify and understand your value and skill set. This is super important. If you're applying for jobs, if you're interviewing, if you're looking for your first job in the industry, this is important. And if you do stuff that isn't necessarily a real job, but you have experience, this is even more important for you. Employers want to know this stuff about you. They want to know where your skill set lies. And if you can back it up with results, that's even better. So you can demonstrate exactly what your value is and not undersell yourself. Beautiful, beautiful. Shout out to K Vine. Matter of fact, y'all follow him. He's always looking for, for quality music. You know what I mean? Don't spam. Don't spam him. You know, that might have started that off wrong <laughs> the way I said that. But no, nah, like he 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 drops and shares like really dope upcoming artists. And obviously he works at GN. So really, really dope person. Follow him and he gives great tips. K Vine, y'all see his, his info on the screen or for y'all listening. K A Y V A N M D. Now about the sauce that he just dropped though. And getting involved in the music industry for jobs. This is where I start. And this is basically what he said. Right? Being able to know your skill set mm-hmm. and communicate that skill set, regardless of if it was a formal job or not. Yeah. I think a lot of us who are inclined to be in the music industry are tend to be entrepreneurial or self starters. So we might do some shows or we might work with an artist or two yeah, like just starting yeah. off and it might not feel like it's official but how do you communicate that and bring that down into a skill set and that's extremely valuable right extremely valuable to have done that because there's a lot of people that aren't doing that type of stuff yeah right and whenever i talk to music execs whether it's the ogs or the new folks that are actually like hiring building businesses through us ourselves that passion shit don't mean nothing, bro. <laughs> <laughs> that passion. Everybody is passionate about music, damn near. If plenty of people who not are in music that are passionate about music. That's not enough. And a lot of times people try to sell themselves that. Yeah. But there's a few things that you can do specifically to bring value. And I'm going to base it off of a convo that I had with um, the VP, the former VP of sales at, at Bad Boy. He really broke it down to me pretty clear but before i get into that detail i want to get your thoughts uh Chikori, on like the things that Kayvon said yeah i mean I, the the other way i was kind of looking at looking at it on top of what you said is being able to communicate value um outside of the music stuff that you might have you know i think a, a lot of people tend to forget about those things oh you know i'm just a manager at i don't know some clothing store i don't see how that ties into music but to someone on the other side, like it might show like that you're good with organization or you know how to run a team or something like that, right? Mm-hmm. So that's the that's the part that kind of stuck out the most to me is like you said, all those things like how can you kind of build your value and build these skill sets that people kind of just want to see you get. Um, but then like what have these other things been teaching you that could be valuable over here? Because, you know, what's one of the things we always talk about with music is they're more than glad to pull people from other industries because a lot of times a lot of these music businesses don't have, you know, um, some of the most like serious infrastructure that some like other industries have, right? And mm-hmm. so you might be looking at it like, oh man, they would never want me. All I did was work in like sales at this, you know, insurance company. But I might be like, no, 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 you know what I'm saying? We've never had a formal, you know what I'm saying, sales structure before. We would love to have somebody from that world come over and teach us how to set it up, you know what I'm saying? So um, yeah, man, don't don't knock these, these uh, non-music skills that you're building, you know what I'm saying? Like people are looking for them. <laughs> hey, speaking of, Right. Sales. Jacory mentioned sales. Y'all hit us up if y'all are already doing formal sales jobs. We got some spaces and places that we might oh, yeah, might be able to help you out with um, and some work for y'all to do if y'all are interested in applying that sales to the music industry. Now, again, back to 
it has to be more than passion. Now, what I the conversation I had, Sean Prez with him, he broke it down to me like this. And it's very simple. It makes the most sense in the world. Literally just showing progress in working with an artist, for instance, yeah, is enough. It doesn't mean, oh, you have to blow an artist up. Just say, oh, I worked with an artist and did some PR for them and I took them from 1,000 streams to 1,500 streams, yeah. right? And yeah. to be able to say I took them from 1,000 followers to 1,200 followers over three months and break down your process exactly what you did to be able to show that is actually more than most people who just come in saying hey i'm passionate about the industry right and i'm yeah. creative that's like a prerequisite we assume that you like music and that you have some inclination or um you know attractiveness to creativity we get that yeah cool. we know you're here for a reason yeah, yeah. You know, like that, that's that's the, the core of it all but saying that I've taken an artist from here to here or saying I put on a show and got this many people out, no matter how big the number is or how small the number is. Hey, I'm this super creative guy and I do fashion. Well, and I want to be a creative director. Well, show us some pictures of some people that you've dressed up or mm -hmm. at least your outfits and show your taste or show that you've done graphic design work. Right. So now, oh, I can see, oh, he can do this graphic design work for me or man, he's done these really dope videos using some some footage from his friend show where he's done these really dope videos just taking shit online and i like his editing skills and i can do these editing skills on your music video right yeah like if you have a hard example it puts you far above most within the music industry and we love to see like some example of skills because it's also an industry where so many people can talk and talk and talk <laughs> you, you know you don't want to get finesse where you got somebody that you have to train on everything. Yeah. Nobody wants to do that in any industry, anywhere if they don't have to, but in music where things move fast and a lot of people don't have like strong infrastructures, they really can't afford to have somebody wasting their time and teach them from ground up. And everybody likes to come with, oh yeah, I'm passionate. I'm gonna give you all my time, just teach me. And you understand, like, college charges you money to teach you right like yeah. <laughs> me giving you my time <laughs> you think oh you're not charging me any money and I, i'm building you up i'm giving you massive value what value are you giving me yeah you know yeah yeah i mean i also look at it too like uh it's like talent a and r you know what i'm saying and you're looking yeah. at this person and like okay well you you put together this show yeah, it only brought out 50 people, but you you shown you have baseline competence and, you know, this type of organization and, and these skill sets. Practice. All right, cool. Yeah, maybe I'll bring you in. I could see you being much stronger in this position in, in a year or two, right? So I, I do think a lot of that happens. You know what I'm saying? Like, yep. we tend to think about um, organizational AR from, like, the creative aspect, right, the artist side, but I don't think enough people think about, like, the, the back-end aspect of it. Like, we're, you're looking at employees almost kind of the same way, right? So... Yeah, like you're always going to want to take the person that has proof of concept and has shown you, I can put this thing together even if it doesn't like hit like crazy. You know, so especially, man, if you like listening, you like a curator or something, you know what I'm saying? Because I know like especially here in Atlanta, you see like a lot of like local curators putting on mm -hmm. shows and things and they will be sick. You know, I only got 50 people out. But like you said, bro, how many people are even putting the work together to bring out that right. amount of people? I right? know you're going to do work. Yeah. We just, we gotta know people are at least willing to do work yeah. half the time, yeah, like, instead of just wait for me to tell you to do every little uh, bit of the task. You are way far ahead in comparison to what you might think you are. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Um, shoot, one more thing that actually made me think about is um, you mentioned the curators, right? Just talent for A and Ring, right? Mm -hmm. That you have a taste in music, so you're showing that you have taste. But at the end of the day. Look, it's the same shit everywhere you go, right? You know yeah. how today we talk about, hey, people don't want to sign artists unless they've shown that they got a fan base, yeah. unless they've built some momentum. Why? Because they don't want to have to go through all this expensive process of training or finding your fan base, going and then putting money into it and helping you get some progress and possibly being a bad product. Quote yeah. unquote, right? It's yeah. like, Bad. how are you? Oh, how are you? It's the same thing, right? Yeah. Got that with the artist. I could train somebody for three months and they not be a, a good hire. And no one wants to spend that time. 
And there's too many people that come in, just like the artists. We talk about artists feeling entitled and thinking the industry should give them things. There's people on the job and skill side that come in thinking about, well, well, what are you going to do for me as a company? You owe me X, Y, and Z before you have an established skill set that has true market value, mm-hmm. right? Not the value that your mom has in you. You know what I mean? Not the value that you have in yourself from talking to yourself in the mirror. Like we, we have this, we have this culture and community today where we focus so much on people, um, you know, owning, having ownership, stepping up and, and not being afraid and knowing their self value and self worth that is going a little bit too far on the other side of the spectrum where people are out of whack on understanding like, yeah, you got to also show and prove, right? Yeah. Starting out in the industry, yeah. like if you're going from one really applicable job and you're getting paid a certain market market rate and you're killing it, you have systems, you don't need training, you're not raw, then you probably can demand a certain amount of things. And you probably have multiple opportunities coming right at you. If you're not in that position, then look for the opportunity, not the immediate payoff, because I can be associated with this company, associated with this artist, and then I can flip the fact that I worked with this artist and done these two, three things to build yeah. out my portfolio, yeah. and I'm more competitive, right? Uh, so there's a lot of different ways to to look at the marketplace, and I know a lot of artists, y'all are interested in working in music, because y'all might be like, look, if I don't when as an artist at least i could be around something i love right? yeah, at least i can touch it yeah at least i can touch it be around the energy be in a better space work on something that i actually do care about or you're like shoot i'm still trying to work my dream but at least i can be in the space yeah. and not hate my job while i try to be an artist and be in a job that teaches me stuff from different perspectives that i'm gonna apply to my own artistry it all works but you have to keep these same things in mind just as somebody who wants to be a you know regular professional in music does as well. Yeah, man, that was well said. <laughs> that was, that was well said, man. <laughs> hey, well, 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 it was well said. We don't even need to go deeper into the topic. Let me take a quick second to say, if you're an artist trying to blow your music up, or if you're a manager, a music professional in general, trying to help an artist blow their music up, I have something that's a game changer for you, and it's completely free. As you may know, we've helped multiple artists go from zero to hundreds of thousands of streams. We've helped multiple artists go from hundreds of thousands to millions of streams, chart on Billboard, go viral, all of that stuff. And we've now made the way we've branded multiple artists and helped them go viral completely free, step by step in Brandman Network. All you have to do is check out brandmannetwork.com. You apply. It's completely free. But the thing is, We're not going to let everybody in forever. So the faster you apply, the better your chance of getting accepted. Brandmannetwork.com. Check it out. Back to the video. Get into the second topic because artists, man, y'all are, y'all aren't doing lives when y'all blow up. And I know a lot of artists don't want to, they don't want to do lives or they don't want to do social media posts before they blow up. Yeah. But it's showing and once they get that power and that dominance and they on a level where they don't have to. I just give it all up. They, just they, give it all they up. They give it up. And that's when it has the most impact. So let's read this post right here that Yana. I hey, appreciate you, Yana. I, I, I don't know who you are and if you really deep in music or is it just an astute fan insight. And I feel like she's just a regular fan who just dropped a gem um, out here for us. But she said when Ari Lennox first came in the industry, she used to be on IG Live all the time. Megan the Stallion was the same. Went live frequently. She did. Doja Cat went live frequently. Yep. They all used to interact with us on there. Now they all go live rarely, if not never. And I think that's so sad. All right. Now, do you think I should read some more of her commentary on this or b- before you bring in your comments or or what? You want to go now or? I mean, uh, yeah, that, that first one is kind of where I'm at with it, you know. What I'm saying? All right. So, so let's yeah, it, it put, yeah, it plays into what I'm gonna say. And she said, in continuation of that tweet, and why did they stop going live? Because the internet is a cruel place, and they were all subjected to heavy criticism, harassment, bullying, whatever if you want to call it. 
random strangers that ain't worth the damn on the internet trying to make them feel bad about themselves. I love worth the damn. Oh, someone say that. Bro, I ain't heard that. Someone say that in a minute. So, okay. Yeah, Bullying. Well, the yeah. way that the the public treats them once they have a platform. Yeah. I've seen that run away some of the strongest soldiers, man. I've seen it push, <laughs> <laughs> push the biggest stars off the top. You think it's all about that? No, I, I think there are probably um, elements of it, too, of, you know, feeling like the thing that you were doing to get you to that point isn't cool to your, your fan base anymore, mm. right? Um, I think sometimes as artists get bigger, they start to sometimes maybe struggle with figuring out how to, like, communicate, like, the new them, you know what I'm saying? Like, we talked about, hey, this was funny, and I was kind of this person when I was a little bit hungry or at this stage in my career, but now I don't relate to that version of me. I'm here now, you know what I'm saying? I don't know how to communicate this to you, you know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. who's still kind of liking me from here. I, I could see a bunch of those different things playing into it because um, I'm hoping it's not just them going like, eh, I don't feel like doing this no more. So let's kind of talk about each thing piece by piece. Yeah. Let's start with the one that I think people think about less often, which is what you said. I'm this person now. I blow up. And not only do I have a larger platform, I'm evolving and I don't know how to communicate that new me. Yeah. Right? I've seen artists or spoken with artists who funny is one thing, actually. That's the most common one where they're trying to transition beyond. And we're talking about people that are looked at as legitimate artists. It's not like, oh, I'm trying to get people to not see me as funny. Um, or some kind of me comedian and now look at me as an artist. We're talking about people who legitimately are already looked at and respected as artists, but they were funnier, lighthearted, more personable yeah. and talked about subjects at one era of their career. And now maybe they're just literally getting older because they were young when they first, you know, hit yeah. in that way yeah. or for whatever life changing reason. They've changed kind of their perspective and they want to be involved in different things or be looked at in what they might call more seriously. Right. That's kind of the elevation of it all. One. Do you think. That is mostly them being in their head or. Mm. And if it's not. Then what's the real issue there? I think most of it is. Is them being in their, in their head because I, I think they forget that they can do a lot of those things that um, they were doing at the earlier stages, like where they are now. Right. So let's say, for example, um, let's take like someone like Doja Cat, for example, like a lot of her earlier lives were just her like laying in her bed, like joking, you know what I'm saying, joking around, kind of like being like really crass on her live. It's like I, I think one aspect of it that her early fans really liked was it felt really like homely i think might be the word i'm looking for right like, oh she she feels just like me she's just laying in bed you know what i'm saying kind of just like cracking jokes yeah, you know relatable so if we fast forward to today what would be different about doja cat doing that now versus back then probably just in a nicer bed you know what i'm saying probably just in a nicer room you know yeah, more, more than more likely impact, because yeah. she's has a even she has a clear difference on where she is status wise so the fact that she's doing the normal, I'm in the bed, will mm -hmm. be even more like relatable or cool when she does it. Yeah, like and, and even the ones who might see it and go like, oh, you know, it's Doja Cat. Of course, she would have a nice bed or whatever. Like the older fans would just see it as a part of the progress narrative, right? Like I remember when you used to be in you know, whatever bed and whatever room you were two, three years ago. Like this mm -hmm. is cool. You still doing that? So I think sometimes like they they overthink it. And they're like, oh, I can't do that anymore. They, they don't care. They don't care to see me do those things I used to do. And it's like, yes, they do. A good portion of your fan base probably does. And then are there things that you were doing back then that you could just repurpose and, and make fit your lifestyle now? Or make right? Like, what's the difference between a vlog of you five years ago and a vlog of you today? Right? Five years ago, you were, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like you had less money, you were in a different place, but it's still the same type of content, right? You know, um, just you kind of you are the thing that changes it. So, yeah, that's why I think it, it's, it's them in their head a lot, right? Like they're thinking like, oh, I can't, I can't do this stuff because I'm so high up, right? Mm -hmm. Like I think bigger artists, especially, tend to think that they hit like a cultural 
um, point where they can't do certain things that people that are smaller than them are doing, right? They get kind of locked into their boss. Oh, I can't do that because I'm so big. And it's like, but that's, like you said, that's what will make it have a crazier impact is because yeah. you're so big and you're doing this thing that we don't expect now, you to unless do. Unless you're dealing with like, Oh, I say crazy shit. Yeah, I'm yeah, so big. Yeah, now yeah. I gotta not be on live as much because they like, yo, yeah. oh, bro, you lose cannon, you know. So lock you back up, man. Man, go yeah. back in your room, man. Get back off your All phone. Right, but here's the <laughs> other perspective on that too, right? What, like, being relatable and doing something like that, I think that translates across the board, no matter what label level you are. Yeah. It's not something you need to stop doing. It's overthinking. If you think, oh, now it makes me feel like I'm too close to them. All that stuff is typically like overblown. But what if I was truly in a space of my career where you know, I was more jokey, jokey and, you know, fart jokes and, yeah. and, you know, more, quote unquote, elementary humor. And now I want to be seen just more serious in terms of the audience in general. Right. Like, let's say the type of stuff Lil Pump used to do. Right. Yeah. Like not his music, not even talking about that part. Let's pretend as an artist with musically the music mat matures with the audience or can have a longer time span. But literally that image of being so playful and doing those type of things, whether he was like, all right, but now I want to be looked at somebody who's like a straight up musician or I want to be looked at somebody as someone who's in fashion or a serious businessman. Mm -hmm. Right. And doing all that type of stuff. Like kind of detracts. From those other brands yeah yeah i'm, I'm imagining a little pump with a real estate company you know what i'm saying yeah that'd be crazy but not in the little pump set fashion right because yeah. little pump could flip right a crazy brand that, like he had before and then just be a crazy real estate brand and have yeah. all that kind of humor and yeah. bullshit going on too but what if he wanted to be looked at it in more of an elevated way because he it was he saw like oh man that brand didn't mature or wouldn't mature like I wanted to, or maybe it did, but it would just be like, nah, I just don't want to be associated with that anymore. I'm a different guy now. Uh, what does that look like to you? I think it will be them changing their lifestyle to kind of fit that and then documenting it. You know, I, I'm a big believer that a rebrand is just this person has changed in terms of like, you know, who they are now. Mm -hmm. And they they just want to show us that like out loud. So now we see them in different places wearing different things. We mm -hmm. see them hanging out with different groups of people. They talk about different types of things, mm -hmm. right? Like when they talk to us. So I'm a big believer, and that's all a rebrand is. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, it's like if, in this hypothetical, what is you know, Lil Pump has opened this this real estate company. Like I want to see some some intellectual content from Lil Pump. You know what I'm saying? Like I want to I want him to to get on his Instagram live and give me ten tips. You know what I'm saying? To to <laughs> <laughs> 10, 10, uh, 10, 10 tips to kill my real estate deal. You know what I'm saying? If I'm an aspiring real estate, realtor or something like that, giving me, you know, the regular person like homeowner advice or something. Um, and then seeing him move in spaces like that. So I think is is it really is as simple as that over a long period of time. Cause you gotta introduce people to it and then you gotta make them believe you. And that's the part right there. Yeah, but believing is just us seeing you do it over and over again for an extended for period of time. time. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. The time is the biggest factor in that. Yeah, it's like a little pump drop real estate content for a year. In a year's time, he would have enough people convinced that he's, he's serious about it, whether or not he really was, right? You know what I'm saying? So I'm glad you said that because <laughs> the biggest pushback that I get from artists who are on those level when we have those conversations mm. is them not seeing the change in the fans perspective fast enough yeah it's like dog they don't know if you're kidding or not dog yeah or they don't know if you just felt this way for the day they or see this so a roll much part of the rollout yeah well, is it a part of the rollout there's so many things yeah. that are in question but if you're just doing it and you're doing it and you're doing it and you're doing it now they know oh yeah that's something you do and that's something that you're serious about the same way that we talk about influencers who are trying to transition to artists it's like, yeah. yeah, you just dropped a random song, but how do they know you're seriously an artist? Well, you got to keep showing yourself as an artist. Keep showing up. Yeah. Keep showing up. Be in the studio. Drop more music and more music. I'm like, oh, he really he really trying that artist thing. So at first, he'll be trying. You know how people talk. Yeah. <laughs> he's okay. Yeah, he's out here. Yeah. Over there. Exactly. Then eventually, well, okay, no, he is an artist, right? Or she is an artist. So whatever that new space, it's the exact same exercise you keep showing, 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 showing over a long enough period of time. And then the people 
won't even just believe it. They will just recognize you as that. Right. Yeah. Like, that's what they know because that's literally what you've been doing. Now, of course, every part of the fan base won't see that immediately, or the people who are outside your regular reach are also going to be probably the last to know in most cases. Yeah. Right. So you got that first part of your fan base seeing it, they see you're doing it, and people outside your um of your reach will still look at you in the same way same man as yesterday but eventually you'll have this moment that pops and they will they'll be like oh man i didn't know little pump was doing real estate that he actually sounds pretty smart and then you have all these people oh man he's been doing this for five years right the commenters in the mm-hmm. community will begin to speak for you so you don't have to worry too much about that part as long as you keep showing yourself in those spaces and you're legitimately moving in those spaces the rebrand will happen, but you know, your brand is essentially your reputation built over time. Mm-hmm. Your rebrand is your new reputation built over time. Exactly. That's what I'm saying, man. And uh, I don't know, like the, the, the time part, the time part is uh, always the, the hardest part, like you said, to get across. It's, it's, but I, I think it always goes back to the whole, um, like building your world aspect too, bro. How much of this just comes down to getting people to believe you. Mm. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, yeah. Like, do we believe that you really know your shit about this real estate stuff? You know, how can you convince me of that? What can you do to mm-hmm. convince these people that, like, hey, I'm taking this thing seriously, or right, you know, or at least attempting to take it seriously? It, it makes me think of like when, um, like Jake Paul them first started doing like the the fighting, you know, what I'm saying fighting thing, yes, bro. Perfect example. Years ago, bro, like when they first started, no way, bro. I was like, there's no way they're not doing it now, mm-hmm. man. I'm like, man, who who was out of doubt division? Yeah, <laughs> he's still doing that shit. Yeah. And you're doing it at a, you know, relatively high level. So, yeah, that's that's all it is. That's all it is. Now, again, there were some other angles that we could approach this artist stop going live when they get big. And, yes, one is, hey, you don't want to do that. And now <laughs> you, you stopped because you did want to do it in the first place, but you used it to flip yeah, to it. Get and get on. Yeah. Now, that one, I can't be mad at all the way. You're not leveraging your your best abilities and all of your platforms and channels, but at least you did it to get <laughs> you there. Because there's a lot of artists who just won't do this shit at all and don't realize that you can stop, yeah. right? Some fans might miss it, yeah, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But this is you in terms of a moment in time. And people don't, they, they take away all of their tools as an independent artist and you need all your tools as an independent artist to punch above your weight class and compete with the rest of this marketplace. Yeah. So, you know, we talk about any means necessary, like some old school shit, right? When they used to talk that type of talk, like, bro, we're not talking about this, you know, abstract evil of selling your soul to the industry and all that type of shit. We're just talking about throwing up a TikTok, dog. Yeah, if I get on live 15 minutes. Yeah, <laughs> do it in your room. Like, yeah, get on live, have some conversations. You know, blow yourself up and then look, when you're done, you're done. And I saw somebody say this. uh, I can't remember who, but it was a conversation about lives and maybe just videos in general. But one artist that actually gives them performance practice. Oh, yeah. Because they don't get to, you know, do shows and everything. So it still gives them a sense of their performance practice. So there's all types of benefits to doing this. And look, one day you're going to be in brand deals and get sponsorships and commercials and all these other things, man. You're getting a yeah. skill set. Like this whole thing is about skill set. You want to take advantage of all these places. But I cannot still be mad all the way because it's still your life, right? If you did it to get there and you knew, like, you, you stuck to the plan, yeah. you got what you needed. And you're good. I might see a higher potential for you, or might want to work for you. But if you, if if you're good where you are, I ain't mad at it, bro. Yeah, they be like, damn, never again. You're just gonna bring all this value to my life as yeah. an internet consumer, and then just take it away. Hey, you know what I'm saying? That's fucked hey. up. And but, but that's <laughs> why that's why I get mad at the cliche that bigger artists can get away without doing it because it's, it's like, yeah, you're right. They can. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? At that point, they have enough of the infrastructure to get away with it. But then as the fan, you're just like, damn, but why? Why not? You know, why won't you come back? <laughs> hey, bro. You know, look, they be teasing. They, some of them do tease and they'll come out 
the woodwork for a little bit. Fans think they're they're about to return. Yeah, for the rollout, bro. That's yeah. why you, you. That's why you that's be suspicious, it man. Is. Either some rollout or they they treat it like a video diary. Which I'm not. I'm not the most mad at the video diary. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm cool with. Yeah. Artists are like hopping on, sharing random information about their life. Yeah. I'm like oh, I just got a pool today, guys. I'm like, oh my god, that's what's up, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, that's the that's the normal relatable shit. It's the it's the concept of having more impact, though. Which I do understand. Yeah, like when it's coming from it comes from that st- standpoint. It's like, oh well, if I put out less, whenever I speak, people are gonna move. I care more about it. Oh yeah. shit, Kendrick Lamar just da, da da da. Whatever that is, he lifted a finger. J Cole, he just did the shit that he did, dropping, you know, uh, oh, over that producer. Yeah, dropping yeah. a song from the producer on YouTube on his the YouTuber's page. Look, that shit ain't a big deal. But it's J. Cole, which makes it a big deal. And J. Cole don't speak or do things like that often, mm-hmm. which makes it an even bigger deal. Right? That's the difference between J. Cole and any random artist that's unknown. A lot of times, right, the barriers are just being who you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, dang, yeah. Yeah, I know that he didn't do anything genius in terms of marketing, but it's going to get called genius yeah. because, <laughs> because of who he is. And they move their weight around. And I, there's a saying about this. I don't know. It's like maybe when a giant lifts his finger or something like that. But, you know, like the impact is just way more. You know what I mean? If a giant taps you on the shoulder versus a little baby, you, you get what I'm saying? <laughs> and figuratively, that might be where you are in your career based on awareness. And if you hear like those like marketer marketers, especially like internet marketers, as much as it might seem like fluff, it is true when sometimes they're like, you're like, man, you know, what's my problem? I'm trying to figure this marketing thing out. It's like, oh yeah, your problem is people don't know you yet. <laughs> and it is so, sometimes, it really yeah. is just that simple and yeah. it sucks. Maybe yeah. you gotta figure out how you get people to know you, but once you got a lot of people who know you. But it gets easier. <laughs> it does get easier. <laughs> it does get easier. So that should be, don't use that as discouragement. Use that as inspiration that one day I, too, can do less and get more. Yeah, yeah. But hopefully you don't. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> hey, that's what makes the goats the goats and the riches the riches. Those are the guys who get more and still do more. It gets easier and they still do more. All right. Like people say what they say about a Kim Kardashian in the world when it comes to money. And like how her family moves, things have probably got easier and easier because more people know them and they can do these little meaningless things and they get all the attention in the world. Yeah. And they still yeah. working their butts off. I know it don't look like they don't work, but like that's just the illusion. Like let's cut out the they don't do anything. You know what I mean? They they do some stuff. You know what I mean? Part some, of part of the allure better. is yeah. making it seem like they don't do anything. You know what I'm saying? Like that's that's part of the uh the the entertainment smoke screen. You know, <laughs> at the very least, they're marketing. Yeah. <laughs> at the very least. That's, Driving that's just the, the brand game. home. They doing the same shit yeah. as all the influence on the IG. They like, you know, posted pictures. Yeah. Getting people interested and shit. It just is what it is. So, you know, I think the last thing in this particular topic then does go to more of the the bullying, mental health side of things where people do consume them content, th- those comments. And at scale, you know, people be hating on our page and shit like that. Have random comments out of nowhere or whatever. We haven't gotten as many uh, lately, but like, hater, if you listening, you know, you late, <laughs> so go ahead and just post something. Remind us that you exist. You're like, dang, ain't nobody hated on them in a minute. <laughs> but no, it's a, I understand how sometimes if you consume that shit heavy, that it probably could affect your psyche. Yeah, no, nah, I mean, I think that's probably one of the the hardest things to get used to as your profile kind of rises, right? Yeah. That's the thing that we see lots of different levels of clients struggle with, right? From mm-hmm. ones that just got their first like 50 fans to ones that go viral, you know what I'm saying? Like, I think that's the hardest thing to get used to is one, just people having an opinion on your life all the time, right? Like you go mm-hmm. from being someone that like not many people cared about, you know what I'm saying? Or a lot of people didn't, so then like, it feels like a shit ton of people care about mm-hmm. you, right? Um, and I, I would always tell clients this around moments that were going, or when they would ask about getting viral moments, I'm like, man, you gotta think, bro. Like, yo, how many DMs do you get a day? You know what I'm saying? Just on some real shit. Like, 
you know, maybe 20, 30 from people that like you. Now imagine shit, you just wake up one day, you got a thousand DMs and a thousand more come in, right? And a thousand more come in, you know, like, like that's a hard thing to get used to, you know? And like almost every content creator and different mediums, you know what I'm saying, to, to, to artists and you know, YouTubers and things like that, they all talk about that being one of the hardest things to get used to, you know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? It's not even just the negative, not even the negative, because I think we tend to kind of scapegoat like the bullying, the harassment aspect of it. Like, yeah, of course that happens, and of course that can push people away. But sometimes just even the act of having to talk to all of these people yeah. is enough. You know what I'm saying? For whether good or bad is enough for some people to get stressed out about it. You know what right? I'm saying? Because and I, a lot of people have some of that people pleasing within them, where they feel like, man, I have all these DMs unanswered, and mm-hmm. now these people, even if they're showing me love are going to be upset that I didn't DM them back, mm-hmm. right? It's like the old school version of that being, can you give me an autograph? And then a star might be afraid to say no yeah. because it's going to be that fan interaction. Well, imagine that shit at scale. And with that fan's interaction today can easily be spread across the internet and everybody find out about that interaction yeah. and that bad Yelp yeah. review essentially that you got on your career yeah. before. Hey, that might be some random dude in the, in the city. <laughs> That has no voice and would never hear about you again. So it's a different climate today, which I I 100% get like just the, the what's a good way to think of it? Customer support. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. That's all it is. Yeah, damn, that's crazy. <laughs> it's, it's fucking customer support and not having the infrastructure to handle it all. Yeah, because it's a lot, man. Like, it's, I don't know. Like, I, that's why I can empathize with artists getting bigger and getting social media management teams. But then you're like, man, but then social media lose a little bit of the personality, right? Mm-hmm. But it's, it's so many different angles to it that yeah. that I understand. But yeah, so even, you know, going back to the conversation of why you should do it, I think if you're an artist that, right, you know you're not the most talkative person, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know that you are, you're weird on camera, you get awkward, like, you definitely need to be doing lives, you know what I'm saying? Because... <laughs> I always tell people, man, like it's the exact same muscle at 10 people as it is a, as a thousand people on your live, right? It's the exact same skill set you practice and how to, how to, you know what I'm saying, get the conversation started, how to, how to get them back involved, how to keep your energy. Like it's all the exact same skill set, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? And so, you know, I think we run into a lot of instances where you'll see these artists pop and they're practicing these very basic skill sets mm-hmm. for the very first time in front of like 10,000 people, you know what I'm saying? 20,000 people. And uh, you see them say things and make these mistakes and do things that kind of are putting. And it's like, man, if you had just all those years ago or months ago, just did a live with two people on it, you know what I'm saying? Just to get comfortable with doing it. Mm -hmm. Then like, think about how much of a, much better of a situation you, you be in now. And I don't know about, you know, everybody, but I'd much rather practice in front of two people than than 20,000. You know what I'm saying? It's the, it's the translated concept of performing. For small rooms before you do stadiums. Yes, exactly. Right. Like same same skills up. Yeah, man. Sure. I mean, look, for context, the way I think of it, logically, I understand the emotions can still be the emotions in the moment that you see the comment. Yeah. You can be very aware of this shit and go through fifty comments of love and then see that one and it will trigger you differently. Yeah. It sucks. We all know that that's that's a real thing. But it became super clear to me. When I had a video I had dropped one day, it's been years now, and one person said, this shit is trash, da-da-da, they went ho- down that entire path, right? It's trash, it's basic, and then another person said, this is the best video you've ever posted. And this is the same comment section. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. <laughs> I can't listen to none of them. You, bro, you, you can't. <laughs> exactly. And it's, it was right there. It's like, man, you don't even know what to do with that. Like, that extremity shows that it's always going to be a reflection of them more than it is you. Yeah. You know? Like, because it's based on where their perspective is. For instance, one of the struggles with teaching online or like having videos and things like that where we offer perspective online, which is why I like the podcast more format better. Is like people uh, consume a video. It could be five tips of something, right? But you might be an 11th grader. The next person might be a second grader. The third person that watches the video might be a PhD in this particular subject. So the relevance to each person varies. And if I intentionally made a video for a second grader 
the PhD might think, oh, it's so simple. You're not giving any game. Like, why are you not giving it out? Or you're not really saying something. And then the PhD, if I make a video for the PhD, the <laughs> that's the funniest stuff. Like when you make the highest level content, usually the second grader will be like, you're not saying anything because it seems like it's not applicable, but it's mm -hmm. very applicable to the PhD who, who's already at that level. Yeah. Right. Because it's them in their day to day. They immediately see where to apply it. Yet the second grader is like, you're not saying anything because they can't see the value yeah. based on where they are. And it's, it's, it's nuanced. Right. And it's not as entertaining because typically the the earlier you are in the process, I find a lot of those people aren't dedicated to the point or they don't have enough of the infrastructure in place with so they don't get the value as they do as someone who's like just getting straight to the point but the the real point not the like marketing points that you see all these youtube videos like oh how to build a fan base and these general tips and how to blow up on tiktok things that we will talk about and have done but it's just in some ways consume more from an entertainment inspiration standpoint versus an application where it doesn't have to be sexy because i'm doing this and bro i just need to know one thing i don't need 10 minutes of like killing it i can listen to this 10 minute video or an hour video and be happy if i get one super strong thing because mm -hmm. i'm gonna put that shit to work today and then probably flip that information into more money or more fans or the or like more business relationships wherever I am, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think what sometimes we have to remind ourselves is people are on different levels who are consuming your content in different spaces in their lives and their perception, right? And it doesn't have to be this education style content, but it's just, that makes a, a clear example. It could be whatever you're doing, right? It's gonna be based on their own experience, whatever that individual experience is, right? Um, so you could be referencing something like I've, you know, somebody will think you stealing from something that you never even seen before in your life. He's like, oh, he just took this from X, Y, and Z. And he's like, bro, I never seen that. But, but yeah. his experience <laughs> makes him feel like, oh, you must've taken it from there. You yeah. know? Yeah. So like, that's just the content world and, and it's unavoidable at scale. Yeah. Like it comes with a job, bro. It's like, there's nothing yeah. that y'all take nothing else away from this. If you're an artist that has no fans, like it's coming. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like it comes with the territory. That is a fact. That is a fact. Now, I would love to know how much would you like to be paid for a show? Okay. Would you be good if someone gave you a hundred K for a show? Yeah, I think An so. Hour long show. What if somebody gave you three mil? Three million? Show? I'll walk off set right now. <laughs> 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 I just well, get up and leave. Well, look, I think that it's, it's very clear for many of y'all who've probably heard this news that Beyonce has an upcoming Dubai show reportedly paying her $24 million, right? But there's context to this that I don't think most people are going to address, right? There's a conversation that I want to play um, from the Patrick Bet Davis podcast where they actually kind of talked about this from a different perspective, but then also there's some stats and facts that people need to know. Corey, I know you said you'll walk off the set for three mil, right? I hear you. And I believe you. <laughs> I believe you, sir. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Hey, I, don't, I, I, I do not blame you at all. <laughs> However, Beyonce actually turned down a $6 million performance fee back in the day. I think 2015. Okay. From, uh, for Uber. It was a company. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, right? I remember that. Yeah. And instead, she said, "I'll take stock." Yeah. Right. Hey, so that's more than three mil, and she was just like, hey, "I ain't gonna do this unless I get some stock." Now, the thing is, it was reportedly worth three hundred mil back in the time, but from a little research, it's actually apparently only worth nine million. I don't know if the stock dropped mm. from three hundred mil to nine mil because I haven't been tracking Uber stuff or. It was just misreported and they made the number seem bigger than it was, right? Mm. But this is these are the type of numbers that Beyonce's playing with. You get what I'm saying? So we're already in a different space. Now, on top of that, remember Beyonce got paid, maybe it might have been like six mil or four mil for her Netflix performance? 
No, not net, but it was a no the Coachella performance. It was a some performance. <sighs> yeah, I know. <sighs> I don't, remember, I don't remember exactly which one. Coachella performance, yes. 2019. Yes. Yes. She got paid between eight to twelve mil, and then there was a whole argument on how much it was worth it or not worth it. Yada yada yada. But then what did Beyonce do? She flipped that into a Netflix special that apparently she got paid like sixty mil for. All right. So again, these are the numbers that Beyonce are, are, are is working with, and the strategy changes how much you're willing to accept. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But. Beyonce, it's fair to say she probably ain't doing it for three mil. All right. Now, with that being said, let's play this clip and then we'll get into some additional commentary on the issue. All right. But here's the clip right here. And the question he posed is, do you think Beyonce is underpaid or overpaid for a $24 million performance in Dubai? Everybody thought that she was overpaid, but he came with a different perspective. She's testing the sound. That's the whole that's being done now, her performance. $24 million for an hour. Okay, so overpaid, underpaid. I'm going to say it's underpaid. Underpaid? underpaid? Oh, you $24 million for an hour? Uh, yeah, so first of all, let's Give do, us the math. Matt. Let's do the math. Mm -hmm. So you're not paying 24 Like a guy offered me to speak at an event. Uh, uh, international right now, I get paid two fifty an hour to speak. Okay? $250,000. So I'm like, oh my God, $250,000. And we turned it down. Not because I'm worried about going to Iraq, but we just turned it down, okay? <laughs> we turned down 90% of speaking opportunities in the States, $200,000. And they say, how is your rate $200,000 an hour? Because it's not an hour. Yeah. You want me to go to LA, I'm losing a full day. You want me to go there? No, it's $200,000 for a day and a half. I'm not doing this for 12. So really $200,000, I'm in Wi-Fi, which is Wi-Fi typically doesn't work when you're 30,000 you know, feet in the air. You, get, you can't get the job done. And so ends up being $200,000 for a day divided by 12 hours. It's really only $16,000 an hour. I can do a lot more than $16,000 an hour. So Beyonce is getting paid $24 million for an hour. For one hour. First of all, the private jet to go to Dubai and come back, you know how much that is? That's a, that's a million and a half. Holy okay? what do you mean? shit. You mean $2 million fee to go oh, from. Oh, you mean, you she mean, has to pay it? You mean uh, for in gas and stuff? Yeah. If you go with, if you what? go with a G6, whatever you do. You're spending a million dollars no. to go to. Of course. What are you, what are you <laughs> bro, talking about? A million dollars, bro. If you if for Christmas you, we went from here to Aspen and back, that's one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Wow. If you're going from here to Dubai, twenty hours, Aspen is four hours. So four, yeah, it's a six hundred thousand dollar bill. And Pat, think is about, what you're spending. About, it's a million dollar bill. And imagine what jet they're sending. Her, so then, bro. who's going with her? There. No, exactly. I've been spending yeah. two million dollars. I can't believe this. <laughs> This is such uh, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I think like the, the point is clear and it actually bring, makes me think of multiple things that are relevant for, for artists on any level. And I know it might seem like, man, there's some big numbers that are being thrown around, but hidden costs. It's like that phone bill. Yeah. AT&T AT used to be. <laughs> notorious about this. Like this is your phone bill, but you got all these hidden fees, the yeah. setup fee and the, the continue to manage you fee or whatever, like whatever, whatever, whatever. All right. It's never just that number. We report these big numbers, but in terms of valuing your time, your systems, et cetera, like what is your time actually worth? You have to evaluate it more than just that number. And for artists, especially on any level, one of the biggest things becomes production costs. Yep. And what does it look like to take your team with you if you do have a team? It's like Glorilla. Remember, Glorilla was talking about, yeah, I'm only paying you X amount of dollars, maybe two racks a month, but also I'm paying for all of your flights to fly with me around the country, uh, whatever, whatever, wherever, like staying in a hotel room because you ain't going to be staying in my hotel room. Yeah, like all, that up. Of, all of these different things that continue to add up. And these are the things that artists have to think about and can get really expensive, especially as you find more success in you have to bring your team with you. It's one thing to have a fixed cost office and everybody go in that office every day. But shoot, I have a mobile office and I have to pay like yeah. and the market prices might go up and an opportunity might come fast. So I don't have a, a lot of lead time. So I'm paying max airplane, uh, you know, ticket fees or whatever yeah. and hotel yeah. fees. All these things are things that become a little bit more complicated and help explain away sometimes why some artists lose money really quickly outside of just like hey i'm wasting it on some chains and you know, that whole stereotype sometimes it's just like the cost of doing business is a lot higher than artists expect yeah yeah 
That's true. Uh, the people booking them expect sometimes. You know what I'm saying? That's true. I've been on that side <laughs> that, <laughs> from the booking side, exactly man. Like, what? Why is it this much? Uh, he has a six piece band that he takes mm-hmm. everywhere he goes. Like, oh, yeah. okay, got gotcha. And he need a, a sprinter van from the airport and all that type of shit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I remember being hit with those. Like, oh, they got to eat while they're here. Like, do they really like, bro? You only gonna be here for you know thirty minutes or whatever. Come on, you don't need to eat, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I remember that. It, was, it sucked to get a have to buy like a Publix platter for people. I'm like, man, that's an extra hundred twenty dollars, <laughs> man. I don't got that shit. All right, well, you gotta go all out and get a Chick Fil A platter, bro. Ah, hey, you gotta go all out. <laughs> <laughs> right, but no, that's that that is a fact. Like all of these hidden fees in different places and spaces. So you have to weigh opportunity cost. You have to weigh the true cost in general. And I think there's opportunity and long term thinking and strategy that might come from that as well. Right? Yeah, yeah. Because I want to. That's what I want to know about. Like, you know, what's she about to flip it into? Because he, you know, you yeah, exactly. You know, you talked about the Netflix special and all that. It's like, man, like, what's what's this about to be? Mm-hmm. She she might have said, okay, I'm gonna do that. Especially if she truly looks at it like what he just said. Like, hey, this is underpaid for me knowing what I can do and make at any given time. Y'all are gonna have to allow me to do X, Y, and Z with yeah. this footage and own this footage and da 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 da, and it might cre- create a whole documentary. So there's things you can do with that and say, hey, going on this experience and knowing that I'm a document, it's gonna be a great look or part of the narrative for the experience and whatever I'm trying to paint. Or sometimes earlier on, the value is hitting that threshold. So let's just say he talked about. Oh, yeah, I get paid 250K per speech or whatever, 200K per speech. And I turn many of them down. But maybe the first couple of times, even though financially where he is, it didn't provide a massive benefit or life change. Mm -hmm. But like just to set that tone, like, all right, let me go ahead and take this one just so people can see and track. Hey, this is what this is what he gets paid. This isn't even just a number like this is what people are paying him to do this show. But now I'm going to be more selective because. I got to look beyond that. If I do one, knowing that 250K isn't going to change his life, then maybe there's a reason because I'm trying to build a narrative. I am yeah. I want to use a YouTube video. I want to talk to that specific audience. I already got that audience. Um, so it's not like going to them is going to give me more than 250K for that awareness. But going to this other audience that I'm getting paid 250K and they really don't know who I am yet. Maybe there's more benefit on the back end, right? You start having to think about things on these different levels. So, you know, I think just thinking the game through, right? Again, the opportunity costs, the true costs, which is the most important cost to start with, right? Yeah. And then how can you flip it? How can you flip it? How does that fit in your strategy or does it not always on whether something's beneficial to you? Just like Cardi B. People were coming down on her. They were trying to finesse. It was so funny because I'm, you know, being in music, bro, like you don't even see the opportunity for roast sometimes because you just know the business too well. Yeah. And then fans come out of left field with some bullshit. And yeah, I was like, well, yeah, what was it? Like, what, what was it? Cardi B did that show. And I forgot who it was. It was like some really rich person's like backyard oh okay i know she's talking about and then, she, yeah, then okay. they start roasting her like yeah. oh she's falling off she doing backyard shows and yeah. she had to be like yo bro i got a million dollars yeah we're gonna show with this it's like a 30 back- minute performance or some shit like that <laughs> this nigga backyard like come yeah on. <laughs> in this backyard i don't have to worry about production value at this, uh, to the same level i'm gonna deal with all those different things i probably don't have to bust it down with Ticketmaster. you know yeah. what i'm saying like <laughs> come on it's, it's a different type of meal like, you know what i mean so like there's there's perspective and like doing so for her probably doing that opportunity one again that sets the tone hey this is what i what i'm bringing in yeah and shoot the value in her time for that on in that versus doing a show because it's not just the cost i might do two mil for doing a an hour show and whatever you know the stadium but Everything I have to go through to do that is probably more and starting to take more time, drain more time. She okay. has young kids, right? Probably values that time. And then you're splitting it with more people. And even whether it's the true financial outcome that makes it worth more or adding in some of the intangibles of your values and whatever you feel like you're missing it. Like these are the things that people are making the decisions off of. But 
Now those private shows, like yeah, we talk bro. about the ladder, the yeah. value ladder, bro, and yes. high ticket experience. Weddings are, are great and everything, but yeah, once you get into I'm performing for like emperors and, yes, and CEOs and company retreats, oh, those bags are different, bro. Yeah, bro. The rich kid birthday parties are like the unspoken heroes of the music industry. <laughs> Man. It's like the college, uh, the college bag, but um a little bit more naive, you know what I'm saying? Hey, wait, hold hold up. Through explain the college bag. Everybody don't know the college bag. Oh, like colleges a lot of times will pay a lot of money to book you as an artist. You know what I'm saying? And uh, the reason I made that comparison, which is funny what you're saying, that mm-hmm. the reason I made a comparison is that if you've ever um, seen what like these college booking people throw artists sometimes, the, the bag don't always make sense, right? Like, like you'll see a, like I've seen small artists, like artists with no fan base, get like 10 bags. You know what I'm saying? 10, like 10 bands from, um, a college just because like we, we got to spend the budget you know what i'm saying it's homecoming week it's whatever we we got to spend it somewhere they do right and then sometimes you'll see what they'll pay for you know even bigger artists bro and like you know a lot of these major artists be knocking these colleges over the head you know what i'm saying because they don't know any better like they don't no. they don't have context and so that's why i said that the the rich kid is right up there with them right they're typically people who aren't like super deep in the industry they don't really know how to gauge like what this person should be charged or even care about this stuff you say like they're not even thinking about production value. oh like oh i just read somewhere that cardi b is a million dollars okay cool so i'm i'm gonna pay her a million you know they're not thinking about it from like oh she was a million because she had production costs and blah blah blah. right like there's mm-hmm. so many uh just points that they don't they don't think about or or have to think about right because they're not even like upset about it you know what i'm saying like like these that's the beauty of the colleges and yeah. you know what I'm saying the, the the rich kids bro like the you know what i'm saying like they they're not upset about it you know what I'm saying? They don't get it, but they don't care. They just want you there because they feel like you'd be fun. You know what I'm saying? Or they like you for whatever reason. Bro, it's it's awesome. beautiful. It's literally everything <laughs> artists ever asked for, bro. So <laughs> No, that last statement is, is true, bro. Everything that they ask for, like you you get your value seen in the truest form outside yeah. of the music industry. Like, it's like right? a, a pure fan with money to spend on you. Like yes. this is what they look like. One hundred percent. Like that's ba- market without the competition yeah because that's not what they're looking at as much it's more about just you for you and look there's no business model attached to it so they're not weighing all these other costs there's no comparison of what your other booking fees are you versus other artists and the way shows are going to look at you because yep. you better believe we it shows we like all right this artist is 5k this artist is 10k but shoot this 5k artist is actually hotter right now and, the, and on the rise, that 10K artist is on, on the way down. So it's going to be cooler for us to get this artist because when this artist is 20K and we can't afford this 5K artist, it's going to look like we brought him in first. Like, this is all the shit that we think yeah. about, yeah. <laughs> like in the music industry. They not think about none of that shit at all yeah. outside of it. So like you're never like your value is going to be squeezed and people aren't working with the same amount of money and budgets. And the return is like tight. These margins are tight. So. They can't even afford to, so they have to think that smart when looking at shows and, and things like that and promoters. So it, it just is what it is, but it, it's a little bit of an explanation for artists who might not get why the numbers might not be as prevalent in music to understand. It's not all coming from like a standpoint of, I just don't see value in you. You know what I mean? They, it's just, they're, they're playing a different game. Those people aren't playing the game. Yeah. They're playing fun. Yeah, like, exactly. They're just they're playing life. Exactly. Bro. <laughs> just, I like this, so I want you here. That, that that's it. That's it. But hey, yeah, when you get in that space where those are your ops, whoo, it is a great space. Great space, bro. It is a beautiful great space. space. To be. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now we got to play one of the clips of of the last four days. You know what I mean? I know many of y'all have already seen this before by the time we talk about it, but check this out because it's a video on. St. John talking about the fact that he didn't really get paid that much for his song with Usher, but I think there's some important points that I don't see people talking about enough. Check it out. Song came out at the time the song streamed 70 million. That's a lot. That's not 70 million dollars. That's a song that he do with Usher. That's what he's referring to. 
and it did 70 million streams. Mathematics, 70 million streams. I own 25% of the songs and it's $3,000 per million stream. It's 3,000 times 70. <laughs> so $210,000, right? It's math. The numbers got to make sense. I'm waiting on a song for two years based on the royalty rate that Spotify pays the publishers. There's two types of money in records. It's publishing money, that's writing, and then it's performance money. It wasn't my I voice. So I'm just on the publishing side. So that $210,000 that that song made had to be bust down. My take on that $210 was $1,500. Oh, and I, yeah. if I'd have put that song out myself and only had 3 million streams, I'd have made 10,000. I said, I'm done. I washed my hands. I was like, this is dumb. You know how hard it is to get these songs on these people who put it out on their own time? The artists who have their own vision for it? For your livelihood to be dependent on somebody else that you don't control or influence, impact or have a relationship with, yeah. and it's not even your worth, you're not even getting paid your weight in salt. I wrote a record for us. Whew. That thing was moving because he talking and he hit so many points that people aren't addressing. Like people keep going back to the fifteen hundred dollars for seventy million streams. We know that. We know that. Look, the stream rate it ain't that much. Yeah. Right. Especially when you look at the percentage, other percentage. So one, I do love that he smartly was like, "Look, man, I could get less streams and make more money." That's the basic indie concept. Indie artists been telling y'all that for forever, man. Like I could not be signed, but get a higher percentage and and do quote unquote worse but make more money yeah right that's something that i i feel like people understand for the most part right now still i think the generalized thinking of i wrote a hit with usher even though 70 million isn't like a usher usher hit you know what i mean but saying i wrote a song that did well with usher and i only made 1500 dollars out off of it that's mind blowing for I know like a lot of consumers and just people in general. Yeah. Right. Because we're not even talking about, oh, it was a work for hire. He actually was participating <laughs> in the back end, right? True credits, et cetera. And he still didn't get paid that much. But when you look at two years, I got $1,500 after two years. Golly. Yeah. You know what I mean? And now this is this how you know this, you could always tell like the artists that are like just older, right? It's just like I can't live off of that shit. Yeah, bro. What's seven fifty a year? What what am I seven fifty a year? Right, exactly. Like, you, you just bust that down into an hourly raise. That's probably like worse than being a waiter who didn't get tips. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. So I mean, he even made that point, right? Like he's like, I would much rather just like take the bet on take the bet on myself. Um and, and and make less there. So I mean, it, it, I don't know, man. That's why I, it, this is always such like a like a thin line for me because like the 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 splits conversation and just how micro those breakdowns can get. Just, Twenty dollars a month. That's what that came down to. That's crazy. Oh, you just did the math on it. Yeah, you can find that shit on the ground. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> you can find that shit on the ground. <laughs> but but it's, it's just because it, I I feel like it's safe to say he's probably locked in some like crazy pub situation you know what i'm saying for it to come down like that that's one of the, but that's why i go back to you know, i don't know you know what i'm saying i don't know i'm gonna throw it out there hey but, but 10k isn't that much either right you're like oh, yeah. i could do 10 mil or 3 mil and get 10k we know that's not all that much either which is something that artists are struggling with but to me the biggest thing out of all this is what the writers are dealing with remember i talk about me not necessarily wanting to manage artists early in my career because i'm like i can't depend my whole life success off this in individual right yeah him from a writer standpoint in this time he's not even talking about individual that he's personally dealing with it's one thing where i'm like bro yo jacory you the artist and bro i gotta like wake you up you're not inspired enough and i have to deal with all this and it's like bro you being lazy but at least i feel like i got direct line of communication and i and i feel like i might be able to influence you a bit right yeah but you're talking about as a songwriter just throwing your music out into the ether and sometimes sometimes and just hoping that it gets picked up you pitch it to somebody and then like he said the artist has their own vision so they might like the song, but then it might not be in this project because it doesn't fit this project. So they have to wait, just like any artist does, right? With their yeah. own music. Oh, if it's here, better than there. So he's talking about after two years getting 1500 I don't know if that's after it came out or whatever, but let's just pretend, which has happened in many songs, it took like five years for the song to come out, right? 
or whether even worse you wrote the shit for dr dre and it never came out <laughs> <laughs> we know how shit go with him right so it might be like five years before you start to see that money. You add in like the amount of time to get them to accept it. You don't know if they're going to accept it at all because you don't have much influence over the situation in many of these situations. So it might take a certain amount of time to get accepted. If it does get accepted, which is, you know, a probability to work with there, then you have the amount of time for it to come out. Then hopefully it performs well. Right. Because that's not guaranteed. We know how hard that shit is. Even the biggest artists have songs that don't do well. Yeah. And then we know how slow music payouts come and how sometimes music payouts don't come in the way they should. And and somebody might end up having to like audit and do all these other things for fifteen hundred dollars over an extended period of time. He said, too, it could have been longer. So. A lot of this in terms of artistry speaks to why especially in today where the opportunity so much there is there bro control as much as you can yeah like just point blank control as much as you can because it's already hard enough to win in this and the further away from the control that you get you're dealing with not only increased probability of failure but you're also dealing with lower percentages if you succeed so the risk factor is high as hell yeah 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 i mean and I do see it from from his side too, where it's like you know it's much easier to get three million streams than seventy million. You know what I'm saying? Like like right. three million is not a not a crazy goal to hit, especially for like an artist of of his caliber. But I, I would devil's advocate a little bit and say, of course, of course. Go like, ahead. And, and this goes back to I w- I would love to know like what his situation was like then, but I would imagine that that. Like having the credits of that song probably opened hella doors for him, right? Yeah. Some that maybe wouldn't have happened if he had put it out under his his own umbrella. And I think just like, because cause what I don't want every artist to hear this and say is like, oh, this is why I never was song right. I'm never giving my shit away. Because mm-hmm. I know a lot of artists that feel exactly like this. Like one, yeah. I don't want to give someone a hit that I feel like could have been for me. You know what I'm saying? Now I'm a little salty about it. <laughs> or two, like you just said, like, nah, like, this is my baby. This is getting too far away from my hands and my control. You know what I'm yep. saying? Those are the, the two main reasons I hear artists say I don't want to do it. But then I think about, like, all of the prolific artists who started out as, like, songwriters. You know what I'm saying? And were willing to give away that shit and probably go through similar situations like this because of the doors that open just from being able to say, like, hey, man, I got an Usher song. I got 70 million, right? Well, I got a or whoever, a Beyonce, some walk or whatever song. Yeah. Um, and then, you know what I'm saying? Now, but but now that I've kind of built that cloud for these situations, now I'm taking the rest of my shit and hoarding and doing what he said. You know what I'm saying? Like so I do think like uh, the other thing I do kind of wish um he would have brought a little clarity on like what part of his career, what point in his career was this? You know what I'm saying? Cause I don't know, like did he write do you know if he wrote that song for us before? Like he started popping as a solo artist if it was like in the, in the midst of it or i think it was before he was starting popping and that was kind of why he made a point i could try to look up what song um it might have been that he's referring to specifically yeah but uh, who else did he write for i remember remember we were we were working with some people when they were like st john used to write for i feel like hella people oh yeah so the song uh he wrote kaiser he worked with her which is like he had all these random credits that okay. people didn't know him for, yeah. right? And you would never expect the artist. He might have had some on Hideaway. I know a lot of people might not even know that song or whatever. But like he, St. John had some credits, like for real, for real. Yeah, like, like he out here. Yeah, with, with different types of artists. No, it's not on Hideaway, but it is with that artist. So I think the happiest medium that I can think of, and of course everybody do their own thing, like whatever makes sense to you, but like me... I would probably strategically, strategically, if I was an artist, compartmentalize it. Like, am I writing a song for Usher? If I was in a position, right, if, and I had somebody connected where I could truly say, hey, I'm trying to write one and pitch it for Usher, Rihanna, whoever, whoever. So I'm not writing this for me anyway. You get what I'm saying? Because yeah. I know some writers who actually do that, right? They're writing in somebody else's voice, but then their music is a their own voice and it's their own experience, right? Yeah, yeah. So, like that probably might help 
some of the dissension between like, oh man, I could have just kept this for myself, yada, yada, yada. Beyond that, yeah, I think it's a fact that yes, there have been people who have been songwriters who have transitioned to artists. However, there is a grave yard of songwriters <laughs> who, you know, never made it to that artist side. However, <laughs> there's also a graveyard of rich songwriters who never became artists. Exactly. So, <laughs> exactly. you know what I mean? It's not the it's not the worst fail if you are a successful songwriter mm-hmm. who just doesn't happen to find your your wings as an artist. Yeah, man, I'm checking that up, man. Twenty said that was twenty dollars a day, man. You get about thirty of them. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's the number we want to work off of. You know what I mean? Yeah. We were talking about twenty dollars a month, by the way. Yeah, I know what I'm saying. Yeah. Like you get, you get about. You know what I'm saying? Maybe about 300, 300 of them. You know what I'm saying? Like 300 <laughs> of them, not 30. Yeah, like 300 of them, man, you know? Okay. You collect them over the years like, like you know, like a like a Quincy Jones seeking Infinity Stones. You know what I'm saying? Like just be out here collecting songwriting credits. Quincy, <laughs> Quincy a different animal right there. That's a different animal. That's why you have some of those, uh, people be saying that kind of stuff like about Puffy and old, old school type yeah. of shit. We're like, man, he didn't even do nothing. All he did was you know, push the button, one button, and, or say turn it louder. And now he on the credits. You know, I don't have no stake in that horse. I don't get <laughs> what, what officially qualifies as production or not. I and mean, I wasn't there. But that, but even if it was that, I cannot understand, right, the incentive to do that. Let me get my yeah. hands on as many of these things it, as possible. That shit might be perfect, but now nah, I'm going to just throw <laughs> in some feedback that's unneeded, but I'm going to put myself on the credits. Cause I'm just trying to make all this add up. One ain't enough. That's what I'm saying, bro. Get all them <laughs> residual checks, bro. Two percent of everything, bro. You know that two percent started stacking up. <laughs> hey, that's a fact, bro. All I need is fifty-two percent, so now I'm at a hundred. <laughs> <laughs> all right, next is oh, skip rates, man. So artists, y'all might not understand that skip rates has a big impact on how your mu- song performs on Spotify, but it does. However, there's a conversation around skip rates that is worth adjusting. Now, this came from an article titled, What is an Average Skip Rate on Spotify? And they kind of get into this talk about skip rates being overrated. That's not something we necessarily agree with, but they have a couple of interesting assertions near the bottom of the article. One being, what is an average skip rate? All right. So, again, skip rate is your song is on Spotify and how often does it get skipped? I can't remember if it matters or well, how much it matters if it gets skipped like within that first 30 seconds versus like two minutes. Yeah. You know, because it still sure does, does. It still counts as a play once it plays past a certain amount of time, but a skip is still a skip. It, it might just be a lower rated skip, right? Yeah, exactly. But um, that basically is something that informs the algorithm and whether you're being pushed out to the right people, right? You get pushed on a on a horrible playlist, you're on a Metallica playlist, and you come in with some, I don't know, Papu style rapping or whatever. <laughs> like, skip, what is this? All right. So, what's an average skip rate? First, it's important to understand that skip rate is defined as what percentage of users are skipping your record before the 30 second mark. Skip rate is always expressed as a percentage that can range from 1 to 100%. According to product, according to product managers at record labels like Sony, Warner and UMG, they see an average skip rate of 32 percent across their frontline releases. Now, 32 percent skip rate. That's a third of the people who are listening to your shit skipping. All right. Now, but take this from experience. Skip rates can be impacted by geos, whether used in listening on mobile or desktop Mail. Okay, I see what they're saying. I don't know why they had to shorten this out of this long ass article. Instead of geos, they should have said geography, right? It could be impacted by geography, whether a user is listening on mobile or desktop, male versus female, all of these things that basically make up demographic, like you would, of course, expect, right? Now, what about music released by independent artists? It's the next question. There's no public data available for it, but this guy basically projected that it'd be an average of 50 to 55% skip rate across front line releases for independent artists, which is interesting. Like, I don't know what he's seeing 
to make this um, prediction. But obviously, he's in a better position than most to have this speculation. But to say, I think independent artists is 50 to 55% skill rate, even though signed artists are 30 to 32% skill rate on average. Like, where does that extra basically 20% come from? Is it just like, hey, there's a lot of bad music out there. So it's like weighted wrong. It's like, oh yeah, this this song got skipped 98% of the time. This other one got skipped 20%, yeah. but it evens out somewhere in the middle. I wonder where that might come from. Yeah, I'm thinking it's either a quality thing, right? Like I know like quality is subjective, whatever, but we could assume that the sign act has higher quality than a, a lot of unsigned acts, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's, 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 like it's a safe assumption. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? They made it that far. So I would think either that has something to do with it or maybe just like trust and perception, right? Mm-hmm. So the sign acts have the the perception of the label behind them or, you know, something that allows them to be in a place where they have a little bit more of a trust value than, right. than the average indie artist. That's the only thing I can think that would play into it because other than that, I'd be like, how would they know? You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. if the song just, I guess if they went to the song intentionally, that could kind of say something, but if it's just coming up on like release radar, or like Discover Weekly or something, like you're just hearing it. That makes me think. So, just like you would break down the quality of the music, you also have to think of the targeting. And then some indie artists don't necessarily target correctly. That's true. Too. Right? Yeah. Or they're going through that exploratory phase, and maybe by the time you're at a label, a lot of that stuff gets more figured out. Yeah, you know. But even at the 32 percent skit rate, I think that's extremely informative number to work with but it does suck that indie artists can't see that for themselves because labels do have this so this is the big point that we do want to land on there's no public data available for the skit rate for artists right however we know these major labels have that now why is that how come artists can't go to their spotify for artists and see the skit rate too much power too much power too much control (laughs) Too much power. Too much control, man. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't even want to say that, man, because I, I, I do give Spotify some credence for um, coming a long way with their analytics set up because they have started to present some metrics that that are, I think, are important. But yeah, for whatever reason, I was like, this is the one they won't let go. Like what? Because remember, we were calculating our own ratios on some things. Yeah. And... They now are doing like some of those things. Yeah, like save the listener. Save the listener ratio, like shit like that. We were just yeah. doing the math ourselves and now they're having it integrated into the platform. So it's like, how groundbreaking is it? Or how are we just giving them a pat on the back for doing their job? No, but that, that's why I think that's the one they won't let go. Cause that's the one where, like, well, I won't say the one because I'm pretty sure there are others that stem from that that we can't see. But that's like the one big one that's out there that like you can't just calculate. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like nobody out there can just calculate it unless you you like deep in the back end. Like man, you get any artist, you know what I'm saying? Um, Spotify for artists password before they made that change, you could calculate your save calculate your save the listener ratio or calculate your playlist percentage and things like that, right? So these are numbers that yeah. Now that I'm saying this out loud, they probably put it out there because they were like, hey, people like Sean and Corey are calculating it anyway. Let's just put a visual to it, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And go ahead and take credit for that. Um, so, but yeah, I don't know why, man. Skip right is the one that will not let, they will not let go. <sighs> That's such important information to me for an artist to have. Like, because I think that actually fills the gap. What do we experience so many times as marketers and artists who try marketing things and then tell us what it looked like when they tried it. We hear people say, oh, snap, I blew up. I went viral or this song is taking off. And we also hear, I got on this playlist and nothing happened. Yep. Or I tried this and nothing happened. Right? Yep. Yep. But skip rate wouldn't be, oh, I just got on that playlist and that playlist was trash. Nothing happened. What if you saw that 100 people listened? And a hundred people said, fuck this shit and skipped it five <laughs> seconds in. Yeah. Twenty seconds in. So now it's telling you something different, right? Yeah. You know, now it's like, oh, my song might not be good. And there's no other metric that truly could clearly give you that. 
that's the most important metric, actually. Mm. When you think about the clarity that that brings, it's like, oh, well, dang, I got my skit rate on this re- on playlist and that versus that playlist is completely different. Maybe that's a better way of targeting. That's yeah. actually the most important metric when you think about it. No, it's true. They even said it, bro. It says what well, labels I already look at as one of the the major four, which I, I wonder what the other three are. I don't know if he says it in this. Uh, but I mean, like, I, I and I go back to the the power, the control, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, that's the only thing I could think of why Spotify wouldn't want to let it go because maybe they want to be the only ones who can really control, like, that level of perception. Like, do people really fuck with this? You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Or is yeah. this all just body numbers and, you know what I'm saying, shit being inflated? You'll never know. Only we know that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Only we have the real, that truth to that, to that, uh, to that question. So, I don't know, man. That's something I could think of because that should have been – an analytic that we got years ago. Years ago, man. And they even said, like, the labels and the big distributors had to negotiate for that mm-hmm. so they could have that API access. And, you know, we've tried to build some things, and some of the value stopped at Spotify. Like, API. Awesome Spotify. Yeah. Spotify, yep. Yep, bro. Exactly. They don't let that data go easy. They don't let that data go easy, just like us being on the run ads. And then, oh, once that shit hits Spotify, you know, who knows what happens, right? You can kind of make assumptions. That's what allows those intermediary links to live, right? And creates that purpose. Yeah. For them. They wouldn't have as much value if Spotify gave us more information. Apple Music gave us more information about what was occurring once we sent people over there. And then you add that to TikTok with the deep links and stuff. And then one day, I wouldn't be surprised if Instagram decides to do something similar or whatever like a lot of those sub link type platforms you know and they're gonna, they gonna lose a little bit of value at least within the music marketing space there still will be value because you can't um you're probably not gonna find everybody do that but uh, like man it, the, the black box is something that's always unnerved me as someone who pays a lot of attention to data yeah. and values like understanding the story because, you know, we, we, we've we hacked as much as we can, but there's nothing like just seeing, like, the hardcore, like, yeah, bro, they just don't like it. Yeah, yeah. that's <laughs> what I'm saying, bro. Like, and I mean, that is why I do give Spotify a little bit of the benefit of the doubt, because they're still, in my opinion, like, the best. Um, the best like, of the worst. Top of the trash Exactly, game. best of the worst, because Apple, yeah, I mean, like, you've seen Apple analysts, bro, that shit. Goat of the garbage. Yeah, man. So they don't. They really don't care. Maybe Audio Mac. Audio Mac has pretty cool analytics, but you know it's Audio yeah. Mac. And yeah, then, Apple is different though. And then I don't even look at Apple YouTube. seriously. It was, exactly, bro. Apple is just like the little definition of like I'm just here because I gotta be. Bro, that's you know exactly what I was thinking, bro. That's. They <laughs> <laughs> got some charts. They exactly got some bro. graphs. You know what I'm saying? I'm some, just showing up to work, bro. Doing the bare minimum. That's exactly. Apple's what analytics get by because of the Shazam feature. That's what that. That's what that. And they, they know that, bro. Like, that's what you yeah, came yeah. for. Shazams and, and streams, bro. What, a, what more do you need? But, <laughs> but yeah, but I, so I do get spot for that benefit of the doubt. But yeah, man, that they've been doing good at like slowly rolling out key features, you know what I'm saying? Key KPIs and new KPIs uh, to give uh, artists a, a bit of a deeper understanding of what they're seeing. So I, I do commend them for that. But I don't know, man. Like I said, hopefully we get that skill right, bro. Because I would love to be at the back of a campaign. Like, mm, you know, I know. <laughs> I know you're saying what you're saying, client, but if we look at this here, it says that it had a skip rate of about, like you said, 85%. I said we need to move this this song choice in a different <laughs> direction. I would love that type of ammo, bro. Hey. This is the ammo everybody waiting on. I love, look, <laughs> for real. For real. That's going to settle the playing field heavy. But maybe we won't profit as much if people find out the truth about themselves. Nah, ain't nothing going to ever... Stop. You think people gonna fight it anyway? Yeah, what? Nobody. Because I'm, I'm thinking, I don't know. Maybe people be so demoralized to nah. find out that people don't like my music. Nah, but they gonna see the stats and be like, oh, psh, couldn't be me. Couldn't be me. Couldn't be me, man. That's yeah. about something wrong. Yeah. <laughs> my Spotify broke. Yeah, I feel sorry <laughs> for that guy who these stats match with. But that's not gonna be me, bro. That's how they all gonna think. <laughs> ah, uh, it's funny because it's true. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, look, let's get into this last topic here. Um, this is off of Academics page. He posted a tweet from Emily Baker White. Should have looked up to see who she is. But our latest employees at TikTok and ByteDance have access to a secret back end button 
that can make any video go viral, immediately pushing it to more viewers. The practice, which TikTok has never disclosed, is known internally as heating, mm. quote unquote. Now, one, you know, I said it since it, it's been brought up. I said this shit, bro, in a video on YouTube documented two, three years ago. It was either 2020, 2019. Why? Has so many things that we said about TikTok been true? Because why we like really took it seriously. We do this, but I am kind of perplexed about the surprise. But I think that's again being in the music industry so long, you forget that people don't know stuff. Yeah, like because essentially what I kind of broke down early was this, but it it, it did throw me early in, in in spot in TikTok, and I'll tell you why. I saw my boy Blackie Speaks make a comment. I'm gonna have to hit him up or whatever. He said every algorithm has this, and there's a lot of people with that kind of feedback, right? Tell you why this TikTok shit is different. Oh, okay, hold up, hold up. Academic said this is a TikTok employee who also actually called this out. So I think that's part of why they're making a big deal. It's somebody from the inside yeah. reporting the inside, right? <sighs> but Yes, al every algorithm has the ability to boost. And it's, it's weird. It's bad terminology to say algorithm. Every platform has the ability to boost you in the algorithm and get you more views that you don't necessarily deserve. Like, hey, you're a celebrity. Get on our platform. We're going to get make sure to um, that you get shown to a certain amount of people. Because how do you convince these celebrities to get on the platform when you're trying to blow up? If I give them those numbers without giving them some sauce. Right. Yeah. Like yeah. they are used to big numbers. It's going to be demoralizing for them to start from ground zero and have to work their way up. So you have to be able to have that type of control. And why wouldn't you if it's your own platform? All right. With that being said, TikTok just felt different when I first understood and saw that on TikTok. It felt like they take more control over the super virality of things than any other platform I had seen before. So you'll have things judged by the algorithm initially and the AI because the, they're not going to do all of that work. They have AI to see if there's certain things said that might need to have the, the post taken down. Right. If you curse or I don't know, you know, let's just insert potential thing that gets taken down for nudity, drugs, guns, et cetera, especially on TikTok. Right. They're super strict about that in comparison. Now, once you get past a certain level, you got those bars but you also have performance it goes up it goes up it goes up gets to a certain point and then you have somebody in my mind this is what it felt like when i first learned it and start talking to people um and even people who yeah i started talking to people it felt like in my mind visually it was like someone in a room to push the button all right yeah whether it was gonna go super viral or they just let that shit rock and it kind of slowly like patterns patterns away or literally hey yo like let's stop this thing it's gone too far this isn't what we want to see tiktok the reason that that became such an issue to a greater extent is not just the control with music because i think we obviously tend to read this shit from music standpoint but remember when they were like there's discrimination going on on tiktok yeah it's like people of a certain race or this person is like special ed and they're not letting their content go as far these women are are like of a certain weight like all these different things they were saying people were discriminating um tiktok against and when you looked at tiktok early on i was always describing it as like disney channel it's like people are comparing this shit to instagram i think one leg is spotify the other leg is disney channel where they're trying to project this overarching brand of what TikTok content looks like. They're trying to control it more than YouTube and Instagram care about what Instagram content looks like. You know what I mean? Yeah. So when you imp you take that, then you throw in a little bit of, you know, China, Chinese culture, the censorship starts to look crazy. And what you decide to go um, let go super viral and not starts to look really crazy. Beyond just the benefits of, oh, I'm a label, you know what I mean? We got some of these types of partnerships now where we can help encourage certain things on certain platforms. You know what I mean? I don't want to ruin no partnerships. So I'm not going to specify which platform, you know <laughs> what I mean? But like beyond that, when you start integrating this 
the suppression of certain demographics and starting to see one type of demographic go more viral than other and one type of content go more viral than other, then it becomes really tricky. Like, what are you trying to encourage? And do I truly, as my brand and person, have an opportunity as uh, for success as some of these other demographics? That's kind of like how how I read it. But the fact they've been doing this shit is. You know, I get. It, of course, it's new to to some, but it is what it is, man. It's just, they just been doing it. Yeah, that's a, that's the biggest thing. I kept forgetting that like other people didn't know because, like I said, like we've known for so long. Yeah. Um, and then I didn't realize that you remember that um that leaked document from inside of TikTok that showed the different tiers of the algorithm and how it worked. I kept forgetting that that was a leaked document. That wasn't like a public report type of thing. You know what I'm talking about? Wait, which one? It was. This was like 20, had to be late 2019, early 2020. There was a document that leaked from the inside that was showing like how TikTok's algorithm worked in like layers. Oh, and, I do remember that. Yeah, it was very technical. That's what I'm saying. Like super technical, right? Like very like, if you know, you know. I keep forgetting that was a if you know, you know moment. Like I felt like mm-hmm. that was one of those things that kind of like yep. everybody knew. You know what I'm saying? So- <laughs> So that's just been like the, the most interesting part of it, but yeah, man, like there are some platforms that I don't think benefit from doing it as much as TikTok does, because like mm-hmm. you said, like TikTok has an image to maintain like of virality, right? Like mm-hmm. people still the the allure of TikTok is still like, oh, this is the place where my ten second video could get hundred and fifty million views on it. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Um, so it has more incentive to have a button like that than something like a YouTube video. YouTube doesn't want everybody getting hell of millions of views on that videos, bro, because then it will, it, will, it will bankrupt Bruh. the economy, you know what I'm saying? You, you just touched on something, like you said, the incentive to create virality and give people that that nugget to chase. But remember early on when people will be talking about, yo, man, I was posting, doing well, but all of a sudden I just started going super viral. Mm-hmm. But then you'll have some people talk about like, after the fact. And I had never seen people speak, not from a sense of, oh, shit, I start going crazy viral and now I'm trying to figure out how to keep going viral and it's not happening as much. People literally would say their experience that like TikTok, it felt like TikTok <laughs> just lifted me up, just lifted them up <laughs> like like a guardian angel. Like people were saying that without any knowledge of how shit works on the inside or anything yeah. <laughs> early on this is before we even fully knew it. That was part of what kind of what led us down that path. Literally, the influencers, the people posting going viral early on would be like, yeah, bro, like TikTok just like lifted me up out of nowhere. And I was getting crazy numbers for like three weeks. And now I'm trying to figure out how to like get back in their good graces. Almost. It was it's, it was such a weird like paradigm and language in the way people spoke about TikTok. <laughs> but but that's because TikTok is different, bro. <laughs> yeah, bro. Yeah, except bro. You two would never. Nah. YouTube would never. Instagram, nah. Instagram don't even have to. They They're have to figure pro- themselves out, bro. Yeah, yeah. They're on a deep spiritual journey. <laughs> but now I'm more so interested to see if one of TikTok rebuttals it. I feel like they're not. They they never do, bro. Like I take, what what I do like, appreciate about TikTok is that like you know they see this because I know they saw when the report got leaked and they didn't feel like they did a lot to, to stop it. They just mm-hmm. kind of like, mm-hmm. yeah, we do. Yeah. And everybody's like, oh, shit. All right. And then we go back about our, our, our day. Because like uh, Blackie was saying, bro, like you feel like every platform at least has the option to do it. Mm-hmm. It's built in there somewhere. But TikTok only one is going to let you know or yeah. let it get out there and don't, don't do anything to stop the narrative, bro. So that's my only <laughs> problem. And I want to be careful because Shawty was young and it's not any negative uh it's not any negative thought I have towards her. It's just the happening of it. Charlie D'Amelio, right? Mm. Because of how I understood TikTok to work in that time, it was very interesting to watch that happen because she was literally chosen at some point. Chosen. Now, the interesting part is you have these people with conspiracies typically like, oh, this person is super connected. This person, it's not like she was like manipulating and they were in back rooms making this shit happen. Yeah. TikTok just chose her. <laughs> yeah. Like literally, just like people would talk about lifting me up and dropping me off. 
She got lifted up as a part of the process, but somehow it, it might have been something she did that kind of kept her in the graces. And then also, I think she did fit a specific look that they wanted to see on their platform. Right. But she just got chosen. And any when you saw the French comedian, that uh dude who like I think he was like a threat to Charlie D'Amelio. I don't know if he ever surpassed. Oh uh, yeah, I know you're talking right? about. Yeah, but yeah, at some point he got chosen. Right when you start, when you hit that certain level on TikTok, you have to be chosen. It doesn't mean that you are on the inside working in those relationships. TikTok has its own agenda of sorts, right? As we've seen, and like, yeah, it was like, oh yeah, here's this narrative. Well. Everybody wants to see somebody beat Charlie D'Amelio and everybody seems to be on this guy's side. Does it not go against anything that we don't want to project anyway? Like mm -hmm. this is a great agenda because maybe some people might be feeling bad that they can't usurp Charlie D'Amelio at the time. So people feel like, oh, man, what's the whole point of this? Because, you know, she's big and she's the, the rich getting richer. Hey, well, this other guy just beat her. And he looks nothing like her and coming from a whole different space. So that might just be to inject a little hope in people's brain, yeah. you know, like yeah. not get too, too deep with it in that way. But it makes me look at their platform a little bit differently in that way because of how that much control they have with their algorithm and how much liberty <laughs> they impress versus other platforms. Yeah. That's what makes me exciting, though. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, except bro, they wouldn't. You, you looking to get chose? Nah. Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> they, they they knew they need a lit music marketer on the platform. You know what I'm saying? I would, hey, I'd take the call and the call for it. Hey, you know bro. what I'm saying? Hey. But like I said, I just appreciate the fact that, like they just they don't care that we know. Because I wish the other the other platforms were also like, bro. Imagine like the the inner workings of the YouTube algorithm get yeah. leaked, bro. That shit would break the internet. You appreciate the gangster of it all? Yeah, 100%. That's it yeah, bro. That's like, hey, bro, we doing it out in the open. You know what I'm saying? Just blowing up who we feel like it and ain't nothing you can do about it. And you still gonna come over here and make it, make a TikTok. Yeah. And you're like, damn, TikTok, you're right. You're right. I am My about bad. to do all that exactly. <laughs> My bad, bro. My bad. <laughs> oh, man. Well, look, that's, th that's today's episode uh we appreciate y'all as always for rocking with us if you made it this far you are one of the most appreciated y'all are true listeners our our true community that's keeping us rocking and why we actually talk about more than just like one short topic um so if y'all continue to get value out of this make sure y'all subscribe and share with people who don't know about it put them on and other than that i'm brandman sean i'm Cover, and we out peace